We'll begin our singing tonight by singing all three verses of number 187. 187. After this song, we'll have our scripture reading and prayer. <clears throat> I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. This afternoon will be taken from 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 3 through 5. But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, to whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, shall shine upon them. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day which you've given us, the day that we've been able to come together and worship you. We pray that our worship has been acceptable unto thee. We're thankful at this time for many blessings that we enjoy every day. We're thankful for this time of year that we see the, the changing of the seasons, the, the, to know that there is truly a God, to see your handiwork in the changing of the seasons. We, our Father in heaven, we ask that you be with those that we know of at this time that are sick, those that are in the nursing homes, those undergoing treatments, we pray that you will be with those in the, in the doctors, the nurses that minister unto them. We pray that they will be back to the normal walks of life and, if at all possible, ultimately be back here at worship with you. We pray that you be with the elders of this congregation as they guide the flock, as they look to your word for guidance. We pray that they will always look to your word. Pray that you be with the deacons of this congregation as they carry out the various works here at East Hill in this congregation. To the teachers, to the, all the members here that do, out, do various works behind the scenes, we're truly thankful. We pray that you will be with Brother Irby tonight if he, as he speaks to us from your word. We pray that we 
we will listen attentively to what he has to say from your word that we can apply it to our everyday lives to be better Christians. We ask that you forgive us of any unforgiven sins that we may have at this time. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. If you'd like to mark the song of invitation, that number at the appropriate time will be number 408. 408. <clears throat> now before Brother Irby presents his lesson tonight, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of number 731. If it's convenient, would you please stand? <clears throat> There's a calm, calm ringing o'er the restless face in the light. certainly do appreciate the opportunity to be back together with you this evening and to spend some time in study of God's Word. It's always a blessing to do so, and uh, of course we look forward to being with you in a special way. We had a beautiful crowd this morning. I don't know if you noticed, it was a very nice crowd. We appreciate the presence of everyone. It had so many good visitors. That's always good to have a lot of good visitors in a, in a crowd like we had today. I ever tell you, maybe I did, I, I try only to repeat the better stories, you know what I mean? So uh, down in LaGrange, Georgia, I was preaching down there for about eight years, and a, a grand old gentleman was an elder there named Howard Lester. Brother Lester was something else, let me tell you. He was an elder in the church, of course, and then he... He was a big, good businessman, very successful businessman, uh, great singer, great singer. Joe, you'd have loved his singing. Thing is, he stuttered when he spoke, but he didn't stutter when he led singing or when he sang. Sang beautifully, sang beautifully. Well, we had one of those, and I don't remember whether it was what we call Easter Sunday or Christmas 
Sunday or whatever it was. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just make it Easter. It's easier. Yeah, because I don't, I forget which one it was. So Mr. Lester always sat right about there. And so after everything was over and the house was full, it had to be Easter. House was full. There was so much finery and frockery and everything. Place was jammed up. Mr. Lester, and I, I'm, I'm up here. If I'd have done what he did, I'd been fired on the spot. But I'm, I'm up here getting ready to uh, walk down, and he stands up. And he was the kind of fellow when he stood up, you just got quiet. And it kind of reminds me of the way y'all talk about Brother Eldridge, you know. And so, anyway, he stood up and he, stood, he, said, he said, I want to, to tell you, you all that I appreciate you being here today and giving us this wonderful crowd. She said, he said, now, for most of you, the, the, not normally here, we'll see you again Christmas. And then he turned around and sat down. Now, you've heard that story told and, and, uh, fictionally, but it happened right in front of my eyes. Now, Brother Lester's daughter, Patricia, was quite the lady, and she went, oh, Daddy. <laughs> but uh, that happened. But it was a good crowd today, and we're so happy when any time we can have a gathering of people and uh, visitors and also have our family come together, such a blessing. We've been studying from the book of John a lot in, in my lessons with you, and, and uh, I want us to think a little bit about something we find in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, it's not verse 32, and we've already done verse 12. This is uh, John chapter 8. Uh, verse 43, verse 43, which, in which Jesus says these words, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Why do you not understand my speech, he says. And then he answers the question, Because you are not able to, to listen to my word. That's the New King James. Some of the other translations say, you're not able to hear my word. And the word he's using for listen or hear here is the word not just being audibly aware, but, but understanding what is said. Now, the context of this situation is that the Jews were rejecting him as the Christ. We know that. I mean, that was the... This particular group of Jews that he was speaking with here in John chapter 8, they rejected him as the Christ. They did not accept him as a Christ. He wasn't the kind of person that they thought they wanted as the Christ. They wanted somebody to lead them out from under Roman domination and to make them a great physical, material nation again. That's what they wanted. And so when he would talk to them about spiritual things, you know, this dichotomy between the spiritual and the material that we find in John, when he would talk to them about spiritual things, they just didn't get it. They did not understand it. They didn't hear it. They wouldn't listen to it. It was just something that they missed altogether. And, you know, right now in our day and time, we live in a time where everybody knows everything. Now, my phone's over there, but I use my phone all the time to find out stuff. I never used to be able to. You know, I had to go to something. You, you kids, listen. It used to be called a library. It's, it's not L-I-B-E-R-R-Y. That's library. That'll do, but it's a library. And what you do is you go in there, and they had something called a card catalog. Look at these looks. Now, the old people are going, I know a card catalog. Younger people are going, card catalog? You got to have a catalog for your cards? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, at Georgia State University, uh, the card catalog I'll probably took up, would take up that wall and that wall, just the card catalog. 
That's the card catalog. So when you needed to know something, you had to go look it up, look, find the, think of the book that you wanted to use, look up the book in the card catalog, find out where it was in the library, and then go, go through the stacks. That's what they called them, the stacks, uh, where the books were stacked. That's why they were called that. You go up there and you find that. So we live in a time where all we have to do is go clickety-click, click, click, and we're, we're into uh, whatever we need to find out. So we think we know everything. As a matter of fact, particularly in technology, science and technology, we know it all. We know it all. We don't know it all, but we think we know it all. But when you start talking to somebody about spiritual matters, like those matters are dealt with here in John chapter 8 and verse 43, People say, no, you can't be certain about any of that. You can be certain about everything else, but you can't be certain about that. So there, we live at a time of a lack of, of certitude about spiritual things, but we know absolutely everything you need to know about material things. Now, I'm exaggerating, but, cause that's, but that's the way the world looks at things. And we really don't know everything we need to know about either the material or the spiritual world. But in particular, if we reject the word of God, we're not going to ever know anything about the spiritual world. And we've talked about this. Just to give you one example, what about the traditional family, which would be represented here? The traditional family, passe, that's all out of date. Forget about the traditional family. Who needs a mom and a dad? You can have two moms, you can have two dads. You can have whatever you want. It doesn't make any difference. There's no certainty with regard to that. Well, that really doesn't make any sense. But that's the way it is in our day and time. And the reason for that is that we have elevated in our culture, in our society, we have elevated something called the phenomenon of choice. The phenomenon of choice. It is obvious that human beings can choose between A and B, one and two. Human beings can make choices. And so the fact that we're able to do that has uh, evolved into the concept and idea that we ought to be able to make a choice about everything in the world, no matter what it is. What kind of family you have, uh, what your sex is, anything like that, just whatever you want it to be, it's going to be that way because we have the right to choose. Well, you know, there's a, there's a political right to choose, you know. There is a polity, human beings getting along with each other. We operate, we do operate under the phenomenon of choice. And uh, the, the most popular form of that kind of government is democracy. And so it works, it works uh, as well as, it works better than most of them, and, and uh, uh, maybe not perfectly, as we have seen in recent times. But the point is, that's the way we operate. But so sometimes we end up thinking that we ought to be able to choose in everything in life like we choose what kind of government we're going to have. Well, does that make any sense? No, because there are some things about life where we are free to choose. We get to choose. Um, I seem to have a conversation with Joe Cooper all the time about ice cream. Now, I don't know why we talk about it so much, but I like ice cream. It's, it's a problem. It's just a problem. But it doesn't really matter what kind of ice cream you like. If you like it, you like it. I like uh, mint chocolate chip. I don't, I don't like the chocolate chips to be too big. I don't like them to be too small. I'm rather a connoisseur of mint chocolate chip. I, uh, I like butter pecan, but you can get it too buttery. You can get it too sweet. I mean, uh, you, I can go on and on. We have the phenomenon of, that's fine. You can choose the kind of ice cream you like. You can choose the kind of pants you like. Yeah, a whole lot of things you can choose. But you know, there's some things in this life that are chosen for us by God. 
And one of them is whether you're going to be a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. I mean, God makes that decision. That's something set up X, Y. That's its biology. It's right there. There it is. There's some things you get to choose about and things you don't get to choose. One thing you don't get to choose about that you might not think about is how you treat people if you're a Christian. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, For whatsoever you would that men would do unto you, how's that end up? Do you also unto them the golden rule. I don't, I don't get to choose to treat people terribly. I don't get to choose to be nasty to folks. Because I'm a Christian. I gave up that choice. I gave up that choice. I sublimate my choice. I might, I might want to just pop somebody right upside the head, but I can't do it. Can't do it. Now, if somebody popped me upside the head first, then I think about it depending upon the size of my opponent. However, when it comes down to it, I can't be mean. I cannot be mean because Jesus told me to treat other people like I want to be treated. I don't get a choice about that. I don't get a choice about that. See, you get choices about some things, some things you don't get choice about. You know, Jesus, Jesus never missed a thing in his teaching. He had the clearest possible view of truth because he is the truth. John 14, 6. You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. In John chapter 8, the problem was, the truth was that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And these people did not want to hear that. Uh, they did not really believe that he would be the Christ, the Son of the living God, because they didn't accept the evidence that had been placed before them by the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and New Testament preachers, people like John the Baptist and others. They didn't accept that. So they rejected it. So what, what form does this rejection take? Now look back to John 8, 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to hear my word. You're not able to hear my word. So what's he talking about? Could they audibly hear his word? They could audibly hear it because they reacted to it. I mean, they got the impulses in the ear, you know, the little membrane shaking, sending a signal. That's working. But they still didn't understand or hear or properly listen. It was blocked. The truth was blocked. The reason they couldn't understand him is that they had blocked the truth about him. You know, when you go shoot, if some of you might enjoy shooting. I enjoy it from time to time. If you're smart, you wear your hearing protection. That's what Bobby sells us. We wear that hearing protection. Uh, I used to go to uh, concerts, and some of them uh, were quite loud. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe somewhere in the neighborhood of Jet Engine Loud, some of those concerts were. Well, I stopped doing that because I realized what it was doing to my hearing, started wearing hearing protection. I looked over at the, at the booth where the guys working the sound at the concert were working, and you know what they had on? Hearing protection. What that tell me? It was loud in there, you see. So you can get your hearing physically blocked. Now, uh, illustration is right here in front of me. Uh, years ago, uh, sweet Ginger, my wife over here, uh, we, she, I, I know I told you this one, she was teaching typing at a business school, and there was about a hundred and some odd IBM Selectric typewriters in there, you know, the ones with the little balls that fly all over the place. And I had to go in there one day and take her her lunch or get something from her or do something like that. I went in, this is up at uh, Jackson, Tennessee, while we were at Freed Hardham. I went in there and I literally covered up my ears. I had to run out of that place. It was so loud in there. Well, sure enough, down the road, she, she got to where she couldn't hear. Her hearing was blocked 
physically. She, she, uh, we, we finally went to the last audiologist we went to before we went to the Wilkerson Center up there in, uh, at Vanderbilt. She said, she said something along the lines of, honey, you're just deaf. That's all there is to it. And she was. But she was the best lip reader they had ever had at Vanderbilt. So she got that implant that unblocked her hearing. That unblocked her hearing. As a matter of fact, her hearing is so good now, Ty, I think she can hear things that I haven't even said yet. <laughs> don't, don't you drop that head. You know what I'm talking about over there. But the people that Jesus was speaking to here in John chapter 8 did not have their ability to hear and understand blocked physically. The impediments that they experienced were things like prejudice, uh, ignorance, and a selfish desire to have things their own way. They wanted a Messiah that just fit their characteristics and not God's. They never gave God the credit he was due for what he had done for them, and they weren't about to do it here. And John 8, 43, I think applies to people in our world today. We cited the current societal problem about the home, the family and the home, but it's not just that. It's, it's, that's just the edge of the sidewalk when it comes to that sort of thing. It's everywhere. You know, we've got all sorts of truth being blocked by our culture and our society. You know, we can just we can deal with the family stuff by going to one passage, in Genesis two twenty four, which says, "For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh." That takes care of that. In the realm of the soul, the essential certainty is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and He is our Savior. And people can choose to be dominated by sin and refuse to accept the salvation that he offers, or we can choose to be free from sin. It's just up to us. There's, there's no spiritual problem in this world that would not be eliminated by allowing Jesus Christ, his grace, his mercy, his plan of salvation to work in our lives and to save our souls. We're not redeemed with the corruptible things of silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1 Verses 18 and following. And Jesus had opponents of his earthly ministry here. And we still have opponents to Jesus' earthly ministry. The passage read before us, I'll read a little bit more before it and after it. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, which says, Therefore, this is Paul writing, of course, Seeing we have this ministry, this service, we have not, uh, as we have received mercy, we faint not, he says. He says, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. This is the kind of stuff that was blocking these people from understanding what Jesus, they wouldn't listen to Jesus. He says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So in our world today, when we run into the same kind of problem Jesus was running into back here, what we do is what's outlined here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in these first few verses. But he says in verse 3, But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now that's the same category of individuals back here in John chapter 8 that will not listen to Jesus. I mean, they're separated by a substantial number of years, but it's still the same group of people. And even today, when folks refuse to see and to hear the gospel, it's the same problem manifesting itself. The gospel, 
you, you young fellows, when you talk to your buddies about the gospel, does it ever seem like it's just not getting there at all? It's just not even making any inroads whatsoever into that other person's mind. To illustrate it the way I'd illustrate it back home, it's like trying to, to convince an Alabama fan to be an Auburn fan. It's just there's no communication happening here. The gospel is being hid, and I'm not elevating being an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan to anything like the gospel, but the point is what God is saying here, that the gospel can be made to be hidden to people if they refuse to hear it. Now, you know, how many of you, when you first came in contact with anybody who was a member of the Lord's Church or the Church of Christ or Restoration Movement people, anything like that. When you first came in contact with them, another friend of yours who perhaps went to another church altogether, did they ever warn you? Did they ever warn you and say, oh, you got to watch those people. you got to watch those people. They'll, they'll twist the Bible. They'll twist the Bible. You need to be careful about those folks. See, I was warned about you, about nice people like you in terms of the gospel. But you see, the people who were warning me, the gospel was hid to them. But it wasn't hidden by any physical malady. It was simply hidden because they hadn't gotten to a place in their lives where they could open their minds to the possibility that God's message was, could be construed and, and could be placed forward before a person's mind in such a simple fashion as Jesus died for our sins and left us a plan of salvation. It's just that simple. And if, if it can stay hidden like that if one's not careful. If one's not careful. Now, I didn't, I didn't uh, listen when I was told to be careful. I, uh, I, I, wanted, I was curious. I was curious. I wanted to see what was going on. See, I'd never heard of the churches of Christ. I'd only heard of the big main churches that you hear about in Protestantism and, and Roman Catholicism. Dated a Catholic girl for three years. I knew all about that. And, Dated Protestant girls and so, so forth. So I, I, I understood what was going on, I thought. When somebody started saying, well, you just don't have to have any of that. You don't need any of that. You don't need any of that structure, or you, you can just go by the Bible. Just go by the gospel itself. And what's so powerful about what Jesus' opponents were seeing down here the fact that it was blocked, the truth was blocked to them. What's so powerful about that is over here in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, the language that is used, it says, in whom the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? This is a good question for down front. Who's the God, little g, of this world? The devil, Satan, the God of this world. That's, he's, he's referred to in that fashion in the Bible. For the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, that's what happens. It's all these societal issues, all these social issues, all of these areas. See, the truth is blocked. Because it suits the devil to block the truth. He doesn't block it physically. People say, oh, I'm scared of the devil. The devil's going to get into my head. No, the devil cannot get into your head. There's only one way. One way he can get in. You've got to let him in. If you're smart and stubborn, or even if you're not so smart, if you're stubborn enough, if you're smart enough to know you don't want the devil rattling around in your head, you don't have to put up with him. You can run him off. 
You can run him all. And you ought to. Text his ear says, Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 5, he said, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants. For Jesus' sake, for God who commanded the light to shine in darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We had this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of power might be of God and not of us. Now listen. You say, well now, Bill, isn't it kind of egotistical for us to say that we can understand the mind of God? Right here, he's spoken to that. It's not egotistical. It is the most humble thing anybody can do is to let the word of God be the thing that directs our minds in spiritual terms. You shall know the truth. You shall make you free. You're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Acts 2, 30, uh, uh, Mark 16, 16. Uh, all of these passages, they're just too simple. All you have to do all anybody has to do to enjoy the salvation God has provided for us is do what it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. 4, 2. Let the truth be mixed with faith. And you'll do that the rest of your life. You never get finished. You never get through. You always grow. You let the truth, the truth of God's word, be mixed with faith. Now, just to wrap this up, our world has chosen a path of uh, fallibility. You know, it's a crooked, unnatural, easy to fall off of path. It's fraught with fallibility. But God's infallible. God's truth is absolutely true and very much reliable. All human philosophy is fallible. Uh, I went through a period I read a lot of philosophy. I thought, well, it's going to make me smart. Gave me a headache. It's, uh, but I still read it. The point is, there's some good things in man's philosophy, and there's some pretty bad things in man's philosophy. All you have to do is check whatever philosopher you're reading against Jesus, the source of all truth. You'll be fine. What about churches? Churches are fallible. The church is infallible. Not the way, not, not, not the human beings, but the plan for the church that's revealed in God's book is absolutely perfect with no exception. But you can't have a church led by a committee or a single person or any compilation of humanity, no matter what the location of it is. It's all fallible. You go by the Bible. That's why the elders go by the Bible. Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 7. They go by the Bible. Somebody says, well, we've got to make a decision. Yeah? What we need to do is discover the decision. Now, there are most decisions that we make in the actual everyday functioning of the Lord's church are really immaterial. I mean, they can go either way. It's practical, practical decisions. Uh, how to do something, when to do something, all that sort of thing. All that practical, practical, good and, and smart people can figure all that out. But the truth that sets a person free has been revealed. All we have to do with that is follow it. Just do exactly what the book says. So, well, I have this book. I got this book, man. This book, this guy. Well, all, there's only one book that's absolutely right all the time. The rest of them have fallibility associated with them. Inspiration is the key, 2 Timothy 3.16. God's inspiration was limited to the time of the Old Testament writers and the New Testament writers. The New Testament writers were the apostles and the people that the apostles laid their hands on to give them the gift of inspiration, the gift listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's inspired. That's the only thing that's inspired. 
And furthermore, God's truth is understandable. You know, when you first start studying the Bible seriously like these kids, listen, the children on the front bench tonight, I would say they probably knew more Bible than a large percentage of the population of Giles County or Limestone County. You say, well, that's ridiculous, Bill. No, it's not ridiculous. Because folks don't study the Bible like they ought to, like they should, like they could. But God's truth is understandable. You say, well, I can't study that book. It's too complicated. Listen, you, you can. You can. Anybody can. We all can. We might not all understand it and remember it all as well as the other person. But we all can understand God's truth if we unblock our ears and open our minds to what Jesus instructs us to know. And once you know it, you know it. I'll give you an example. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What does that tell you? I've been talking for what, three or four months now about the spirit, superiority of the spiritual over the material. Jesus said it in one sentence. Yeah, you've got to have bread. You've got to have something to eat. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy that part of life. you got to have that. But that's not the way we live. Not all together and only. We live, we truly live spiritually by every word that proceeds, proceeds out of the mouth of God. Y'all like, uh, y'all like the little cartoon Peanuts? You know, Lucy and Schroeder and all that bunch. You know, I like that. I like that. I wouldn't say that I agree with everything Mr. Schultz's philosophy, but I sure do like it. And you know what Lucy would call somebody who was, in her mind, not operating at peak intellectual level? She would call them blockheads. Particularly, she called Charlie Brown a blockhead. I think that really fits perfectly, John 8, 43. These men had their heads blocked so that they could not receive what Jesus was telling them that would save their souls. And just remember that, folks. I know most people in here are faithful Christians, especially if you're of the age of accountability. That's a wonderful blessing. If you're not, you can come and obey the gospel tonight. Be baptized into Christ to be raised to walk in newness of life. And then if you're, if you're a Christian and you've, you've fallen off the right way, you've somehow slipped off the, the right walk, you can get back on that walk. See, Jesus is just full of mercy and grace and all of that. Ephesians chapter 2, read the whole chapter. He'll take you back. Just the way he is. He's just, he's just somebody who loves everybody. And if we love him back, we'll do his will. So if you need some help from Jesus tonight, you, you, that help is it's not something you have to go get. That help's right here. Because he's right here. The truth is here. If you need to come to the Lord, if you need to come back to the Lord, if you need the prayers of these people, please come as together we stand and sing.
If you did not have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, that has been left prepared. If you have that need, we ask you to come to the front during the first verse of 946, and then you'll be served. <clears throat> Why did my Savior come to give thanks for the bread. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for once again giving us another day of life. Thank you for this opportunity of prayer. Father, we approach you now to give thanks for this bread, which to the Christian represents Christ's broken body on that cross at Calvary. Father, we understand the emblems that we take and why we take them, and we're thankful for these emblems and what they mean. We pray that we take it, those taking do so in a well-pleasing manner and in accordance to your will. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, in like manner, we give thanks for this cup, which represents Christ's shed blood for the remission of our sins. Father, we're thankful for that avenue. We're thankful for the sacrifice that was made for us that day. We pray that as we take this, we do so in a well-pleasing manner in accordance to your will. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Our closing song tonight will be number 570. 570, we'll sing verses 1 and 3, and then we'll have our dismissal prayer. And then after the dismissal prayer, we ask you to be seated uh, for a few brief announcements. Would you please stand as we sing? <clears throat> Tarry with me, oh my
Our most gracious, loving, kind Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for giving us this opportunity to come together on the first day of the week and to sing songs to praises and to your name, to pray as we are now and ask of our what we need from you and pray that for your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and to give of our means, partake of the Lord's Supper, sing songs of praise, and just to be together and to hear from your word. Thank you for this church here at East Hill and for the works they do. Thank you for the eldership, our deacons, our teachers, and all that is in attendance. We want to thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without him coming and offering up his own blood, we could not have forgiveness and be with you forever. Thank you for those blessings. Thank you for the spiritual blessings, the material blessings. Thank you for the, even the gift of life. At this time, we want to ask your blessings on the sick of our congregation, those that have got upcoming operations and different things. Bless them as only you can do. Be with those that have lost loved ones in this congregation. Be with this congregation as we go into the future. Be with us in all we do. Pray that everything we do is, is in accordance to your will and pleasing to you. Thank you, Brother Irby, and the lesson he brought to us tonight. In Christ's name we pray, amen.